Welcome to CLCC Online. We pray that this message draws you towards Jesus and strengthens your walk with Him. We believe that we were meant to do life in community. So if you live in the Fraser Valley area, we would love to get you connected into the family. Find everything you need at clcc.ca. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for welcoming us into your homes. We're at the very end of our series, which has been a church-wide initiative where everybody in the church has been looking and studying the same kinds of things for the last several weeks. And our series has been about heart conditions, uh, trouble with our spiritual heart. We might say spiritual heart diseases that can take us out. And uh, today I want to talk about fear. There's a story that's often been attributed to Robert Louis Stevenson. The story is of a ship which is being tossed in a raging storm and the passengers on the ship are below deck and one of the passengers decides to go up onto the deck of the ship and go into the bridge to see what's going on. And uh, he's fearful, he climbs up onto the deck of the ship, the rain is lashing, the wind is blowing across the, the ship, he's just barely, you know, fighting the wind and the, and the rain. He makes it to the bridge of the uh, ship and he opens the door to the bridge and he looks in and the, the pilot of the ship is holding onto the wheel of the ship and he's steering the ship into the wind to, to best uh, prepare for the storm. And the pilot turns to the passenger and he smiles at him. Immediately the passenger makes his way across the deck and he goes down below deck and he says to the other passengers, all is well, the pilot smiled at me. You see, when the pilot is in control, when the one who's, who, who knows what he's doing is in control, we don't need to be afraid. Well, fear is one of the big heart diseases that can take us out. And I think there's plenty of fear going around these days. So we're going to look at a story from Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, and talk about fear. It's a fairly familiar passage of scripture. This is how it goes. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and he was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, let's pray. Father, we do confess there's a lot of fear in our world today. Uh, we confess at times we are at almost overwhelmed with the fear that, that can come through, uh, well, the times that we live in, the circumstances of our families and our lives and, and all that's going on and the world around us. And, and Lord, I pray that we would have faith instead of fear. I pray that you would help us to look at the right things and not the wrong things. I pray that you would help us to be like Jesus and that you would help us to increase our faith so that we would not be fearful in the midst of the storms. In your name we pray, amen. So in our story, Jesus is completely exhausted. He, he's, he's been working really hard and they've been traveling. And uh, it tells us that he went into the stern of the ship, the, the back of the boat, and he lay down on some cushions and he fell asleep. Now this is typical in Mark's gospel. Mark loves to tell us about the humanity of Jesus. And he wasn't just God, he was also human. He was in the flesh. So he's asleep in the stern of the boat. And, and what this would have reminded the first century readers when they first read the gospel story, it would immediately have reminded the Jewish reader of the story of Jonah because it was a familiar story to them. And Jonah too was asleep in a boat when a great storm happened on the sea. Do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah was also a prophet. He wasn't a great prophet. In fact, he was a very bad prophet. Jesus was the greatest prophet. So Jonah, uh, who's been directed by the Lord to go to Nineveh 
to preach uh, grace to them, that, that God would save them if they would turn to him. Jonah doesn't like the Ninevites, and so he heads in the opposite direction. He gets down in a boat. He, begin, he wants to sail in the opposite direction of Nineveh, but God sends a great storm, and the sea gets very tumultuous, and the sailors are fearing for their lives, and they're all calling out to their gods, and Jonah's asleep. And so they wake Jonah up, and they say to Jonah, aren't you afraid to perish? Call on your God that he would save us from this calamity. Jonah realizing that the storm was because he was outside of God's will and that he was running from God, he says, ah, what the solution to the problem really is to throw me overboard. Uh, just get rid of me and the storm will subside. And so the, the readers of Mark's gospel for the first time, the Jewish readers would have thought, oh, this story is familiar. What's going to happen now? Will the disciples begin to call out to their gods like the heathens did in the day of Jonah? Uh, will they want to throw Jesus overboard? What's happening in the story? Well, you see, Jonah had a good reason to be afraid. Uh, he was directly opposing what God had wanted him to do. And listen, friends, if you're directly and intentionally not following what God has told you to do, you should be afraid you should be very afraid. But that's not the case of the disciples. They're not out of sync with what God was wanting to do. They were in the middle of a mission. They were following Jesus. They were get going with Jesus across the sea in order to reach a whole group of new people. You see, fear is not like jealousy and greed. It's not a sin. Fear is a warning signal. It's a warning signal like pain. It's a warning signal that says, hey, pay attention, focus. There's something going on here that needs your attention. So sometimes fear in our lives can be a good thing. Like personally, um, I fear heights. Uh, it's, it's not that I wouldn't go up a ladder onto my roof, but I want to really make sure that that ladder is safe and secure and maybe have someone hold the ladder at, and when I go up the ladder. I, I think that fear is a good thing. I, I, I'm I'm afraid of falling. Uh, see, fear is not a sin. Fear is a warning that something goes on. And it's how we respond to fear that can be either sinful or a, a positive response to the fear. So the disciples are afraid because the storm is raging about, about the boat. But they're focusing on the storm. Now notice how Jesus doesn't focus on the storm at all when he wakes up. He focuses on the mission. He focuses on faith. He says, peace be still. He quiets the storm. And, and many times when we're feeling afraid, it's because we're afraid of, because in the midst of the circumstances, there seems to be so storm and chaos and, and turbulence and difficulties. And we're forgetting to look at the mission. We're forgetting that if we're in the center of God's will, if we are following what God want us, wants us to do, if Jesus is in the boat with us, we need not fear the storms. You see, the choice that we always have to make is, uh, do we put our eyes on the storm or do we put our eyes on the mission? Faith focuses on the mission. Now, if, if Jesus had been focusing on the storm, when they woke him up, he could have had several things to say to them. He could have said to them, bail more quickly. He could have said to them, put your life jackets on, if the storm was the focus. He could have said, um, what's the matter with you guys? You're sailors, you should know what to do. He could have said, abandon ship. He could have said, call the Coast Guard. Those would all be storm focuses kind of responses if he was simply caught up in the storm. But Jesus was looking at the storm and the circumstances from a different perspective. He was looking at it from this perspective that they were on mission for God. After all, he had come to earth to accomplish a purpose. And if they were going to draw, drown in this storm, he had called these disciples to accomplish it with him, the purposes of God would never be accomplished. You see, the storms of life are opportunities for God to show his faithfulness to us. It's in the storms that we learn to trust him. And, and everybody, by the way, everybody experiences storms. Storms of anxiety. Have you ever had an anxiety attack? Have you ever just been momentarily at least just overwhelmed by circumstances, by decisions, by things that are going on in your life and, and you just can't seem to see an end of it or a solution to it? We can become 
fearful because of the storms of anxiety. Well, storms of life problems also, you know, uh, health reversals, financial reversals, uh, problematic, rebellious children, uh, uh, aging parents, all of these kinds of storms come into our life from time to time. But remember, storms do not imply abandonment. Just because you're in the midst of a storm, just because the waters are troubled and the sea is shaking and moving about, it doesn't mean that you're abandoned. Jesus was in the boat with them. And so when Jesus is in the midst of our storms, we can find a sense of peace and tranquility because we know the master of the storm is with us. We are not alone. Now, Jesus is not afraid of the storm at all. He, he shows that in, in the words that he says. Uh, now, keep in mind, the disciples were the expert sailors. Uh, a lot of them were fishermen. They had spent their life. In fact, this was their, so to speak, home sea. This is near where they lived. Uh, they were very familiar with the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee was prone to tumultuous storms, uh, squalls that would come uh, without any warning. They were familiar with that. Jesus was a carpenter. That was his trade. He, he probably you know, in a humanly speaking, knew very little about sailing. They were the experts. He was confident, though, that nothing could destroy the work of God. And he has some pointed words for the disciples because they weren't getting that. Perhaps some of the harshest things that Jesus said in the Gospels to the disciples are found right here. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? After all we've been through, after all you've seen me do, after your understanding, your, your, your fresh understanding that, that I have been sent by God with this purpose to, to bring the world to know the Father, uh, where's your faith? Have you forgotten what this is all about? You see, the big lesson of discipleship is that we always want Jesus to do things while he wants us to trust him. <laughs> I think what the disciples were hoping is that Jesus would help them bail the boat. <laughs> you know, hey, wake up, Jesus. <laughs> Grab a bucket, start bailing. Help us out. We need your help. We need your strength. And his purpose, he wants them to have faith. He wants them to have confidence that the work of God will prevail. You know, what I found in my life is that Jesus rarely does things our way. I've begged Jesus to do things my way. I've bargained with Jesus to do things my way. I have tried and strained, and to the best of my ability, I have endeavored to force Jesus to do what I want him to do. And sometimes I just say, Lord, if you're not doing it, do something. Do something. But you know what? <laughs> Jesus doesn't respond at times and do the things we want him to do. He wants us to have faith. I found that Jesus is, is very strong-willed, <laughs> and I cannot move him off of what he wants to do. But after all, isn't the fact that when we first come to Jesus, we say to him, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And I, I think sometimes we forget that, and we try to make him see things our way and do things our way. Ah, uh, isn't that the point of having faith? that when God doesn't act, when Jesus doesn't do what we want him to do, that we trust him. He's the master of the winds and the waves. We need to invite Jesus into the storms that we experience. You know, Lord, I'm going through a rough time right now, but I know you're in the boat with me. And, and I recognize that the danger is not the storm outside the boat, it's the storm inside the boat that could sink me. So calm the storm in my life. Where Jesus is, storms become calm. I'm not talking about the water outside. I'm talking about the storm inside. You see, the storm at sea in the gospel here and throughout the New Testament is an ancient symbol for chaos. That's why in the book of Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth has no sea because sea is the symbol of chaos and evil. In, in our story, Jesus, in fact, exorcises the storm. He performs an exorcism on the storm. Uh, he perceives 
that the storm is evil, that the storm has been sent by the enemy in order to uh, thwart, squash, um, stop the plan of God for the disciples and him to reach the other shore. He uses the same words to calm the storms as he used to cast the demon out in Mark chapter 1, verse 25. He says to him, be quiet. In the same kind of demonstrative voice, Jesus spoke to, speaks to the chaos, to the storm around them. And the disciples say, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Well, in, in, in Mark's literary way, he's going to give us the answer through a demoniac. In Mark chapter 5, verse 7, the demoniac says, this is Jesus, son of the most high God. Oh, if the disciples had remembered that and remembered the mission, they wouldn't have been so afraid in the middle of the storm. The heart disease we call fear is a symptom, really, of a wrong-headed view of God. Either he is in charge or we're all sunk. You see what I did there? Yeah, storm, sea, sunk, yeah. Each of the heart diseases, in fact, that we've been talking about indicate a wrong view of God, whether it's guilt or anger or greed or jealousy or fear. All of these heart issues put us at the center of our world and God or Jesus somewhere on the outside. I remember an old gospel tract called The Four Spiritual Laws that basically said, you know, uh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but there's something broken, there's something wrong. And one of the last pages of the tract of the, of the little uh, paper that, that shared the gospel was that Jesus needs to be in the center of their heart. And there was a little picture of a chair in someone's heart. And, and it, it, either you're sitting on the chair and the throne of your heart, or you allow God to come in and sit on that chair in the throne of your heart. And, and this is the issue. Is Jesus on the chair in the center of your heart? Is he is the center of your life? Is his mission, is his purpose the center of your life? Or is he just on the outside? Bring him to the inside. Bring him to the center of the world. The proper view of God to deal with all of these hearts issues is to have a much bigger God, a God who is control not only the universe, but even control of us, our hearts. Well, what are some lessons from the storm? Jesus' presence guarantees success. While we may want Jesus to do something, in fact, anything, he wants us to trust him. None of the forces that oppose God's work can concede. So here's the key. This is what I've learned. My concern is always to check in my heart to make sure that I'm doing God's will, that I'm in the center of God's purposes. Now, I'm a pastor and you may say, oh, you're, you're a pastor, that's, that's what you do. Not necessarily. Uh, anybody, uh, whether you're a tradesman or whether you're an engineer or whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, whatever you do, you need to be in the center of God's will. And, and the center of God's will means to be doing those things that God has called you to do, to serve as a, as a part of a family, to serve as, as part of a, a Christian community, to serve in your workplace as, as uh, the image uh, bearer of God, as the one who has the good news. Uh, when you're in on mission, when you realize that God is work at work with you, within you and through you, then there's tremendous safety there. That's like saying God's in the boat with me. I know that it's the storms outside. They cannot affect me because I know that I'm on point. I am on mission to serve God and that whatever happens, whatever goes on in my life, God is going to work it out for his honor and glory. The safest place to be, folks, is in the center of God's will. Choose not to focus on the storm. Choose rather to focus on the mission. That's the key. Let's pray. So, Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us in the midst of the storms of our lives because all of us, whether we have just gone through a storm or we're going through a storm, we will go through storms. We, we know that. That's part of life. But we know that with you are with us. We're safe. Lord, uh, thank you that uh, you bring peace to our hearts 
you bring calmness to us when we remember that we are on mission, when we remember that, that you've called us to serve you and you are going to enable us to accomplish what you've called us to do. So Lord, I pray those people uh, who are listening to me, watching, uh, who might be in the middle of a, of a, a tough situation right now, I, I pray that they would take their eyes off the storm and begin to look at life with the eyes of faith and trust you, trust you. Not to act necessarily, though at times you do miraculously, but rather that you are with them and that you will calm them and that you will work all things out for your honor and your glory and our best interest. Thank you for your grace at work in our lives. We worship you for this. We put you in the center. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks for joining us. If you are looking to get connected, we are one church in multiple locations. Our Aldergrove campus meets at Parkside Elementary School Sundays at 1030. Our Abbotsford campus has three services each Sunday, 830, 10, and 1130. We would love to see you at one of our in-person gatherings. If you would like to financially support us, you can always give at cscca slash give. See you later.